Controllers are underrated. Of this, I am certain. Some are wildly different, but somehow intuitive. Others make you wonder how they ever made it to retail. It doesn't matter if a game has the best graphics, sound, music, and gameplay if a bad controller destroys the experience. Third-party controllers, as well as adapters to allow controllers from one generation to be used with consoles from other generations, also exist. The most impressive adapter I've seen so far allows you to hook a PS2 DualShock 2 to an Atari 5200, eliminating frustrations caused by the Atari 5200 joystick's lack of ability to self-center, as well as making twin-stick games much easier to play. Of course, we can also build our own controllers. While some might be built for research purposes, most are typically crafted for a superior experience in gameplay, typically for the genre of head-to-head -head fighting games. But the reasons for creating a custom controller don't have to be limited to something like Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, and the like. They can be used with anything. If you want to build a custom joystick with high-quality parts and hook it up to your vintage PC to play Commander Keen, you can. But here is my target for this video, the Atari 7800. Its joysticks don't seem to have the best build quality. As a matter of fact, both of my ProLine controllers need some TLC as they don't function. I started working on them, but there is one other problem that no amount of repair will remedy. These ProLine controllers are uncomfortable to hold. Many in the Atari community refer to them as the pain line controllers, and I can certainly understand why. And speaking of the Atari community, the Atari homebrew scene is absolutely amazing, especially for the 2600. Spiceware's Draconian, a Bosconian-inspired game, as well as the recent release of Champ Games' Galagon, a wonderful Galaga port, are two of my favorites. Recently, I've seen an increase in homebrew developers for other Atari systems, including the Atari 7800, and with that comes a recent acquisition, Baby Pac-Man, for the Atari 7800. Have you heard of Baby Pac-Man? Released in the arcades in the early 80s, it is a hybrid video game and pinball machine. The video portion consists of a maze where the player eats pellets, standard fare for any member of the Pac-Man family. When exiting the maze at the bottom of the screen, the game shifts to pinball mode. The player uses buttons on the side of the cabinet to activate the flippers in the playfield, like your typical pinball machine. As you might imagine, a home port of this requires more than just porting a little bit of code. It essentially needs video pinball programming written from scratch. Today, we are fortunate to have things such as VPX and Pin Mame to let us simulate both the video and pinball parts of the game. The results are quite impressive. But I'm excited about the 7800 Homebrew. The 7800 feels like a system that is a perfect match for Baby Pac-Man. I'll tell you what doesn't feel like a perfect match, this controller. Despite the left and right buttons with a joystick in the middle, I'd like something a bit more suited to pinball. While there are official 7800 gamepads as well as hacks for other gamepads to make them 7800 compatible, I want a joystick. Turns out, I have a candidate for modification. This. This is a Radica Space Invaders TV plug-and-play system. It is from 2003, is not very impressive when it comes to game selection, and has some corrosion in the battery compartment anyway. Better to mod it. I am far from the first person to adapt an RSI to a 7800, and the reason is that it does lend itself well to a two-button system. The joystick is switch-based. The buttons are smaller than standard arcade size, but the layout is such that it allows me to play either right-handed or left-handed, and, specifically for Baby Pac-Man, lets me use one button to either side of the stick for playing pinball. So what's the plan? I would like the ability to swap buttons on one side of the controller. The buttons will mirror each other just like the stock Radica unit, but the pair on the left side can be swapped using a physical switch. The existing slide switch for power is a perfect spot to repurpose for button swapping. As far as the cost of parts, the budget is probably about $4 for a 9-pin extension cable. I'll cut the end off one side and wire it up to the stick and buttons. Maybe $0.05 cents for two resistors? And finally, 50 cents for a double pull, double throw, on-on slide switch for the button swapping. So I'm looking at a budget of 4 to $5 plus some wire to convert this plug-and-play game into an Atari 2600-7800 controller. That really isn't bad at all if you already have some old plug-and-play system sitting in a bin somewhere to use as a controller. The thing is, I eventually blew this budget. <laughs> but we'll get to that in a moment. Let's talk modifications. If we flip the game over and remove the screws and bottom plate, it is easy to see the simple makeup inside. The clicky joystick, the buttons, the PCB with the game information, power input, power switch, and AV cable input. I'll gut the unnecessary components first, the PCB, AV cables, power input, and the switch I'm replacing. Now we are left with the joystick buttons and the various wires. It is ready to be joined to the 9-pin extension cable and have 7800 appropriate resistors incorporated, but 
there was something bothering me about this thing. I don't like these buttons. They're too mushy. Let's take a closer look at one of them. It uses a membrane, similar to what a gamepad uses, inside each button. For a gamepad, this works. For a larger button, I feel it doesn't give enough tactile feedback. The NES Advantage does the same thing. It is basically a giant gamepad with larger buttons and a joystick. We'll get to this one at some point. For the RSI buttons, the spring inside is cone-shaped, so it gets a bit smaller as it moves from plastic button to membrane. It seems to work okay, but sometimes has a bit of a rocking motion to it. I can't use full-size arcade parts in this enclosure. It is too small. To give you an idea of the size, this is a HAP Controls competition joystick. There is no way something like this would have the clearance it needs inside this enclosure. Normal arcade buttons are about 30 millimeters in diameter. The RSI buttons are smaller than this, but are close enough to a standard 24 millimeter size. So, I ordered these 24 millimeter buttons made by Simitsu, model PS14D, to replace the stock buttons. I also picked up some springs to increase the force required by half a newton. In total, this ran me about $12. There, the button now takes a bit more force to press and has a faster return time. Most people probably don't give a lot of thought to the springs inside buttons and think only about the switch mechanism, but springs are very important when it comes to how a controller feels. If you are trying to decide what parts to buy to build a controller, think beyond default offerings from popular brands. In fact, let's take a look at a few other underrated parts of a controller. In addition to the springs used in buttons, there is also one inside your joystick. This spring here is a two pound tension spring made for a Sanwa brand joystick, like the one I used in this six button controller. These springs help determine how tight the joystick feels. Sometimes joysticks will have some sort of restrictor plate or gate on the bottom of the stick to limit movement. This one has a square shape to it and provides a good deal of freedom inside eight different directions. It is a default of sorts. An octagonal gate restricts joystick motion and provides a wall at the corners. The square, octagon, and circle gates are often discussed among fans of fighting games as each person finds their comfort zone. There is no right answer. Each gate still provides eight directions, some to a greater degree than others. But what if you wanted less than eight directions? This Sanwa gate has the ability to change from allowing eight directions to only allowing four directions by turning the square 45 degrees. Why would you want to do this? What uses only four directions? Well, the Pac-Man family of games, maze games, are a prime example. What sort of difference would it make? Have you ever played a Pac-Man game on a gamepad or even a typical eight-way joystick and missed a turn? Perhaps you were moving right, wanted to go up, but kept going right? You had to double back or change your strategy because you missed the turn. Why? It is possible that instead of pressing up at the proper time, you pressed up right on the way to pressing up. For a game that doesn't do diagonals, what happens if you hit a diagonal? A four-way joystick or a four-way gate would help for games like these. Two-way gates also exist. Galaga is a prime example of a two-way game, games made for the Space Invaders family. So there are a few examples of things to help think outside the box when building an arcade controller. Returning to the RSI controller, the only major change I'm going to make is to remove the stock buttons, widen the holes a bit, and drop in the new ones. This red-orange color combo of controls is a little bold, but the buttons fit nicely. Time to wire things up. The 7800 directional movement is quite simple. Pins 1 to 4 are up, down, left, and right. Pin 8 is ground, so each direction is connected to the appropriate pin on one side of its switch and the other side is connected to ground. Pushing a joystick in one or more directions bridges the appropriate signals for those directions to ground. The buttons are the odd part. Both the left and right buttons have one side connected to pin 6. Pin 6 is the pin used for the single button on the Atari 2600 controller. The second side of each button connects to the appropriate 7800 action pin, pin 9 for the left button and pin 5 for the right button. On that same side, each button is also connected to its own 620 ohm resistor, and those resistors lead to ground. A rather atypical setup, but it allows two individual buttons on the 7800 while allowing either to represent the single action button when plugged into a 2600. As for the buttons on the left side of the controller, these will be swapped thanks to a switch. Pins 5 and 9 will go to the center of the switch. The outer pins connect to the second side of each button. When the switch is this way, the buttons mirror their counterparts on the right side of the joystick. When the switch is flipped to the other side, the buttons are swapped. I may change the wiring in the future, so my work here is of passable quality.
Let's play Baby Pac-Man. Hey, it works quite well. It is certainly more comfortable than using the Pro-Line controller and is also more responsive. The stock stick is eight-way, so no four-way gating to help with the maze areas. The buttons are very responsive and connect me to video pinball so well that it put a smile on my face, which all controllers should do. I don't know if you've ever given thought to building your own controller, either from scratch or by modifying something that already exists, but these things are as subjective as taste in music. Two people aren't going to have the same opinion on what is good and what is bad. As for future changes for this one, well, perhaps I could find a superior joystick that would fit inside the enclosure. One that would allow me to change from 8-way to 4-way and back would be ideal. I could also make some wire and switch changes so it could hook up to a Sega Master System, or maybe an MSX. The four buttons could also be treated independently, and the RSI could be used as a Nintendo controller. Who knows? For the moment, however, it is time for Baby Pac-Man. Thanks for watching.